Good evening, First Norfolk family and friends. Thank you for joining with us tonight in this time of Bible study as we take a look at Psalm 59. I encourage you to go ahead and start turning to Psalm 59. While you're turning there, remind you uh, that God has given us great opportunities to be a witness for Him in our world. Even though we're living in a time of distance and even masks, uh, you have the chance, the opportunity to demonstrate hope in a hopeless world, uh, uh, joy in a hapless life. You've got the opportunity uh, to be a witness of of God's uh, uh, great love for you. Uh, Last week when we were reading through the Bible reading plan, uh, we came across uh, Acts chapter 19, verse 20. And in Acts chapter 19, verse 20, the apostle Paul is in Ephesus, and he's been teaching, he with Silas, been teaching in Ephesus for two years. There's been some opposition, there's been some conflict, but uh, he has been kicked out of the synagogue, and some of the people, and we'll see uh, right after that, you've got a group of people that uh, bring a riot against Paul uh, because of his teaching, Uh, and he's teaching in a theater called Tyrannus, and as he's teaching there, uh, Acts chapter 19, verse 20 says, And the word of the Lord grew and prevailed. Uh, now, here's what I want us to see. In, in, a, in, in the theater of ideas and philosoph- philosophies and uh, 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 ideologies and ways of life, in the theater of ideas, the Word of God prevails. The Word of God will grow and prevail. We believe that God's Word, the gospel itself, the, the, the opportunity to have a relationship with God through faith in Christ and, and, and have the fullness of life because of our relationship with God, we believe the Word of God Um, It changes lives, and it is stronger and more powerful than any other ideology or philosophy out there. We believe that in the theater of ideas, the Word of God will prevail. So as you go into your workplace or go into your school or as you go into your neighborhood, trust the power of God working through His Word. It will prevail. And even when you come across... um, uh, people who have um, differing ideologies or thought processes or maybe even a little antagonistic toward you because you're a follower of Jesus, understand that when we confidently and accurately present the Word of God to people, the Word of God prevails. Um, and, and so let's be faithful in being a witness in our communities. Uh, well, Psalm 59, uh, the psalm we're looking at tonight, Uh, speaks to us about God being our defense. And in 17 verses, uh, the psalmist speaks about the pain of his life, uh, the struggle of his circumstances, the uh, he, he talks about a pack of wild dogs uh, attacking him, looking t- uh, for him uh, to eat him up. And, and, and the imagery is amazing. Uh, But as we look at uh, this psalm, uh, the focus is not on the enemies. The focus is on God and his help. Uh, So as we look at this psalm, uh, last week I ended with uh, a a verse from A Mighty Fortress is Our God, written by Martin Luther in 1529. I want us to look a little bit more at this uh, hymn. And if you don't know it, I encourage you to Google it, listen to it, download it on your uh, uh, iTunes or, or uh, Spotify or whatever, and, and, and listen to this song. It's a great encouragement and has been for centuries now to followers of Jesus. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe, doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great, and armed with cruel hate, our earth is not his equal. Did we in our own strength confide, uh, our striving would be losing. Were not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing, 
dost ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord Sabaoth, his name, from age to age the same. And he must win the battle. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fail him. That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. The spirit and the gifts are ours through him who with us sideth. Let goods and kindreds go, this mortal life also. The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. Amen. In this hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, we hear the beautiful picture of God, our defense. And when we feel uh, the need for help, we can be confident that God is our defense. When we're being attacked, as the psalmist was here in Psalm 59, when we're being attacked and it seems like a pack of wild, hungry dogs are marauding after us, we go to the Lord in prayer, trusting in His covenant love. And in this prayer that the psalmist prays, as we pray it in our seasons of struggle, we mobilize God's faithful love into our setting in our lives. As we look at this psalm, I want us to begin by looking at the pack of dogs. Now, this is in verses 6 through 8 and verses 14 and 15. Uh, verse 6 through 8, at evening they uh, return. They growl like a dog. He's talking about these enemies. Uh, th- and, and they go around all around the city. Indeed, they foam with their mouth. Swords are in their lips, for they say, who hears? But you, O Lord, shall laugh at them. You shall have all the nations in derision. Go down to verse 14. At evening they return. They growl like a dog and go all around the city. They wander up and down for food and howl or whine if they're not satisfied. The picture here is uh, of people who are uh, gathered together to attack us, to attack those who belong to God. Uh, they're, they're foaming at the mouth. Uh, and New King James Version says they belch from their mouth. It, it, that term means they pour forth. It's, it, it, it's, it's probably more salivating in, in the imagery of verses 6 and 7. They're, they're, they're wandering around. They're salivating like a pack of wild dogs looking for prey. And in verses 14 and 15, you are the prey. I am the prey. They're after us. They're not satisfied with all the other things they've gotten. They're prowling around the city and, and, and they're, they're attacking us. We are their prey. In verse uh, 7, it says that the swords are in their lips. Simply, uh, their teeth, uh, their words are like sharp teeth that that tear at us. Uh, But verse 8 gives us confidence when we uh, look at this description of the enemies, this pack of wild dogs. We still have confidence because God is stronger than any pack of wild dogs. Uh, uh, verse 8 says that, that uh, this pack of wild dogs thinks they're strong, but God just laughs in derision at them uh, because he will win the battle. There is no one who can conquer our God. And when we are with our God, there is no one that can conquer us. And we have this description of this pack of wild dogs. And sometimes we feel that way. We feel like uh, the world is against us and not in in a narcissistic kind of way. We feel like the world is against us because there are actually groups of people that are after us or attacking us or uh, or dismantling, uh, in their view, our future. They're, they're seeking our harm and not our good. They're looking to, to, to beat us up and to overwhelm us. It may be people. It could be circumstances. In principle, we're, we're, we're talking about people here in this psalm, but think about circumstances that feel that. Where do you go and what do you do? Uh, when you have a pack of wild dogs after you. And the psalmist tells us that we must pray 
for God's deliverance. Duh, right? I, I, but it, can I just humbly suggest that maybe that's where we're missing it? We're not asking God to act. We're not asking for His deliverance. We're not, we're not pleading with Him in prayer for Him to deliver us when we are helpless and in need, when we're uh, uh, marauded by uh, uh, lions and tigers and bears, when we're overwhelmed with circumstances that we can't control. Maybe we need to make it our business to uh, spend time in the prayer closet with God, crying out for His deliverance. And in verses 1 through 5, uh, we see the psalmist doing this very thing. This plea is more poignant uh, because uh, the psalmist is facing this attack, not because of his sin, but just because of the wickedness of the people. You know, sometimes we are um, attacked not because we've done anything wrong against God or even others, but just because people are evil, wicked, and mean. You think about uh, the, the uh, January 6th riot uh, at the Capitol, and, and I think about those Capitol police who were standing, doing their job, not doing anything wrong, just doing their job, wearing the uniform of heroes for us. And they're standing between a mob of people trying to uh, uh, garner entrance into a place where they don't belong. And some of these bad actors in this riot start beating them about the head and shoulders with flagpoles. Oh, those policemen didn't do anything wrong. They just did their job, but they were being attacked nonetheless. That's what happens to us sometimes in settings where people who are hurting for their own reasons decide they're going to hurt us. And that's something of what we see in this psalm. Look at verses 1 through 5. Do, uh, verse, uh, verse 1, deliver me from my enemies, O God. Defend me from those who rise up against me. Deliver me from the workers of iniquity and save me from bloodthirsty men. For look, they lie in wait for my life. The mighty gather against me, not for my transgression nor for my sin. They run and they prepare themselves through no fault of my own. Awake to help me and behold. You, therefore, O Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, awake to punish the nations. Do not be merciful to any wicked transgressors. Now, there are four specific requests when we pray for God's deliverance. The first one is deliver me. Uh, in the language of the text, the very first verse, whatever the situation, we can depend upon God to bring deliverance our way. This, this uh, uh, imperative, this uh, request of God, deliver. It means, God, this is my situation. It may be a varied situation, may be different than other situations, but this is my situation. But whatever my situation, I can count on you and your faithful love to deliver me, to bring deliverance my way. The second request is defend me. Um, there in the second part of verse 1, uh, defend me from those who rise up against me. Uh, it's pretty powerful, this, this verb, defend. It means to protect, but it's, it's a verb, and in a few minutes, we're going to see the noun uh, uh, fortress. Uh, the the uh, related verb is this one, defend. It is a picture of God protecting us, and it's the same idea of God being our refuge or our fortress. And it's painting a picture of God lifting us up out of reach of those who would attack us. Now, here in verse, second part of verse 1, it says, defend me from those who rise up against me. He's saying, they're rising up, but God, will you lift me higher? Isn't that a beautiful picture and a beautiful prayer? God, lift me higher than the attacks of those who are coming after me. Protect me because you are my fortress. The, the, uh, when we pray for deliverance, we're praying for God to deliver us, whatever our situation, to defend us or protect us, to put us out of reach of those who attack us. Uh, the third request is, oh God, save me. Verse 3, it says that they're lying in wait for my life. They're, they're gathering together, and it's not for my transgression nor for my sin. They run and they prepare themselves through no fault of, of mine. Um, but God, I want, I'm asking you to save me. And the second part of verse 2, save me from bloodthirsty men. Now, here's the picture 
uh, the picture of save there in, in the Hebrew language is a picture of uh, filling us with a quality of life, security. It certainly means to rescue, uh, but, but it's a rescuing to something, not just a rescuing from something. It's a rescue to an abundance in life. As we look at this prayer and this plea, as we're asking God to deliver us, we're asking God not only to rescue us from a bad circumstance, but we're asking God to rescue us toward the best, toward abundance in His uh, family. This is what Jesus came to give us. He came to give us an abundant life. And through his death on the cross for our sin and, 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 and his resurrection from the dead, uh, Jesus, who is God, who became a man, who lived sinlessly, who died in my place and for my sin, so that I might find forgiveness, so that I might find new life. When I place my faith in him, he brings me into the family of God. I now am a son of God, and you are a daughter of God, and we live in the abundance of God's family. And even though we have circumstances that swirl around us and people that may attack us, we can have confidence today. We can have confidence today because our God saves us out of sin and toward an abundance of life. We have security in the rescuing love of God. So when we pray, we give voice to that good news that has become the theme of our life. We give voice to the gospel that has awakened us to hope and joy and peace. When we pray for God's deliverance, we pray for God to deliver us, to defend us, to save us. And then we pray for God to arise to help us. And this is the last part of of verse 4 and verse 5. And he's talking about those who are after him, the pack of wild dogs. And then verse, uh, at the end of verse 4, it says, Awake to help me and behold. It says, God, look and see me. See me in my pain. See me in my distress. See me in my circumstance. God, wake up and see me. Verse 5, You therefore, O Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, awake, rise up. You are the God of hosts, Lord Sabaoth, his name. He is the God who is our warrior, who defends and protects us. We can count on God's power to defeat those who come against us. And in the context here, uh, it includes the enemies who have no part in covenant relationship with God. This is the picture of nations awake to punish all the nations. That term nations is uh, we think in geopolitical terms, there's the nation, um, United States of America, or, or uh, 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 Canada, or uh, the nation of Great Britain. We think of, of the nations, but, but here it's more of a spiritual term. It's more of a relational term. The, the nations here, it's, uh, you're either part of God's family or not part of God's family. And the language here, uh, talking about people who are not part of of God's family. He says, okay, these are the people that are attacking. They don't belong to you. They're not a part of covenant relationship with you. They may even be in our community, but they're not faithful to you. God, rise up. See how they're attacking me. These are the pack of wild dogs that are against me. Will you rise up and punish them? So, as we look at, at uh, the the description of these wild dogs, and we pray for deliverance. Deliver me, defend me, save me, rise up, and help me. The second part of our prayer is a declaration of our trust in God. Uh, when things are desperate, we who belong to God can trust God because of His love. Now, I want you to look at verses 9 through 13. It says, I will wait for you. O oh, you, his strength or my strength. For God is my defense, my fortress. My God of mercy. And that term for mercy is the uh, covenant term, hesed. It means the steadfast, never failing, always faithful love of God. The God of mercy shall come to meet me. God, let me see uh, my desire on my enemies. Don't slay them, lest my people forget. Scatter them by your power and bring them down, O Lord, our shield. For the sin of their mouth and the words of their lips, let them be taken in their pride. 
and for the cursing and lying which they speak. Consume them in wrath. Consume them, that they may be not. And let them know that God rules in Jacob to the ends of the earth. Uh, the verses 11 through 13, uh, it, it kind of unique because it talks about uh, asking God not to, not, not to slay the enemies at first, but rather uh, to punish them so that the world might see what happens when God's people are um, attacked. The second part, 12 and 13, um, uh, after looking to God as the shield of our life, 12 and 13, it says, now uh, let them by their own wickedness um, fall prey to their own wickedness. Um, as we see these verses, really the theme that stands out is, is not the demise of the wicked, but rather it's the love of God for his people and our trust in him. The psalmist says, you are the God of mercy to me. That, you know what that means? It means that God has brought us into his family and he loves us as a father loves his son or daughter. He's brought us into his family and he, and he loves us with an everlasting love, a faithful love, and we can count on him to bring us into protective care, to be our defense, to be the shield for us. We can count on him. And so in our prayer, as we're asking God for deliverance in faith, we declare our trust in God. God, I trust you. I trust your love. I know these are hard times. I know these are difficult days, but God, I trust you. The ravaging pack of wild dogs is uh, after me and I hear them howling, but God, I'm not going to, I'm not going to fall prey to fear, but rather I'm going to awake and in faith, because you have loved me so well, I trust that you will continue to love me so well. You are faithful. And sometimes the simplest prayer that we can pray is, oh God, thank you for loving me. Oh God, love me. When we look to God's faithful love, and as we celebrate and think about God's faithful love, as we put our trust in God because of his love, because he's made a promise to us, he'll never leave us nor forsake us. He's made a promise to us that we are more than conquerors through him who has loved us. He, he's made a promise to us. There's no more condemnation, but now we're part of his family. Uh, he's made a promise to us that he will care for us uh, as a father for his children, giving good things. He's made a promise to us that he is the God of all comfort. He's made a promise to us so we can cling to him. He is faithful in every way to the promise that he has made. Today, we need to trust God and trust God. Um, it's so easy for us to put our trust in other things, a bank account or a friend or an earthly leader. And we give allegiance to those things, and, and yet the one who has given us life from the inside out, we fail to trust him. He is our hope every day that we live. He is our life. <laughs> so let's put our trust in him, in prayer, we ask God for deliverance. And deliver me, defend me, save me, arise to help me. We, we pray uh, with a declaration of our trust. God, I believe that you will do exactly what I've asked you to do because of your love. And then finally, we close the prayer uh, by singing praise to the Lord. We sing praise to the Lord. Look at verse 16 and 17. But I, now, verse 14 and 15, the dogs return, right? Um, in, in, in verse 13, he's asking God to consume them, and he believes that he will, but the dogs return. Uh, so this is evening, and at evening they return, they growl like a dog, they wander around, they're looking to you as their food. Verse 16, but I will sing of your power. I will sing aloud of your steadfast love in the morning. For you have been my defense. You have been refuge in the day of my trouble. To you, O oh my strength, I will sing praises. For God is my defense, my God of steadfast love. 
when the whining and the howling of, of ravaging dogs, our, our enemies and those who oppress us, when, when, when it fills the, fills the night sky of, uh, of their gnashing teeth and ravaging ways, we drown out the noise of their growling with songs of praise to God for his protection. We praise God for he is our refuge. He is our fortress. He is our defense. We praise God for who he is. He is our strength. When you're facing fearful things or fearful foes, drown out the noise of the fear with songs of praise, declaring, Oh God, I praise you for you are the Lord Sabaoth. You're the Lord of hosts. No one can conquer you. You are my refuge. You are my shield. You are my fortress, my defense. You lift me higher than the outstretched arms of my enemies. God, I sing praise to you in the morning. We praise God for his protection. We praise God for his steadfast love. The last word of this prayer. The last word of this psalm is God's steadfast love. His love gets the last word. In every circumstance, in every situation of your life and mine, as followers of Jesus Christ, God's love always gets the last word. His love that has rescued us from sin's embrace and brought us into God's family. This love that sent Jesus on a rescue mission for a sinner unworthy of his love, but loved still. This love that sent Jesus to die on a cross, to hang there in shame and condemnation, carrying the weight of my sin upon himself, paying the price that my sin, uh, the, the price and the cost that my sin had incurred. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and he gave Jesus to be the payment price for our sin. Here we have this love displayed in full color to us who are followers of Christ who have received this love. We are recipients of this love and this love continues on, not merely getting us out of hell, but moving us into God's family, not saved merely from our sin, but saved into security for everyday life because we now walk hand in hand with the giver of that love. His spirit reigns in our heart and we have a song of praise to sing. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never fading. May God bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he bless your coming in and may he bless your going out and may he fill your heart and your lips with praise because of his great love. God bless you. Good evening.